into the present heaven. In the present heaven, we will wait for the tribulation to end. We will return with Jesus to this present earth to rule and reign for a thousand years. When we return with Jesus, we will not return to the present heaven again. We will rule and reign with him for a thousand years, make a short pit stop, if you will, at the judgment seat of, or the, the white throne judgment where the lost are judged, where we judge. There's a verse that says, know you not that you will judge the world, you will judge with Jesus. And then we will go to our eternal destiny, the, the future new heaven and new earth. Note, those that die as unbelievers go immediately to an intermediate place called hell. Hell is later cast into the lake of fire for eternity after the great white throne judgment. This will be covered in phase four of our study. Um, and, then, and you can read uh, Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. I have the verses there for you. So, starting off, where does the believer go when they die? In Randy Alcorn's book, Heaven, he asks the question, will, will we live in heaven forever? And this is how he answers it. It depends on what we mean by heaven. Will we be with the Lord forever? Absolutely. Will we always be with him in exactly the same place that heaven is now? No. In the present heaven, we'll be in Christ's presence and we'll be joyful, but we'll be looking forward to our bodily resurrection and permanent relocation to the new earth. And of course, he, he left out the millennial reign. He's just being broad in his explanation. So we're going to talk about point A here, Biblical support for the immediate existence in the present heaven after the death of the believer. The first thing I want to say, and I'm just going to say it again, there's no soul sleep. John 11, 23 through 27 says this. Jesus saith unto her, well, let's, let's go there. Let's, let's open our Bibles to John chapter 11 because we need to get the context of the story. Now, we all are familiar with the story of Lazarus in John chapter 11. Now, Jesus knew that Lazarus was sick, and uh, in verse 4, I want you to see that he says, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. And uh, in verse 11, we see that these things said he, and after that he saith unto him, now look what he says, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Now look further down, he says that uh, they thought that they were talking about him uh, being asleep, he has to point out to them that he's dead. In verse 13, how be it Jesus spake of his death. So this is a point you can make to the folks who say, well, the Bible says we sleep. Yes, the body dies. That's what it's talking about. But the soul goes to be with the Lord. Then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. So he delayed purposely so that they would see from Lazarus being raised from the dead to the glory of God that he was the Son of God. But look at what uh, Martha does when he does take his time getting there. She says in verse 21, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother has, had not died. You took too long. You pondered too well, he has a purpose in this. Look what he says in verse 23. Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And then Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And now look at this verse 26. And whosoever liveth, and believeth in me, that would be us, at one point we believed on Jesus, shall never die. And then he looks at Martha, no doubt, and looks her in the eye and says, 
Believest thou this? How about you? Do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, paid the penalty on the cross for those sins, and then rose from the dead? The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. We that believed are, believe are saved. Present tense. We have life. Not sometime in the future. We will never, ever die. So, death has no sting. I don't like the transition much. It sounds like it might be a little painful. Might be prolonged. There might be suffering. No, I don't like the transition. I don't think any of us do. I don't even like to think about it. But I sure love the end result. We'll be with Jesus forever. So I want you to note in the above scripture, the scripture we just read, that Martha states her belief in the resurrection of all believers in the last day, but Jesus wants her to understand that anyone who trusts him in this life has eternal life now, and even at death will live on. Jesus wants her to understand that believers never die. So it is clear from this passage that we will never die, referring to spiritual death. We will not experience, the overcomers, that's us, will not experience the second death. If you read the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, you'll find that there are eight or ten things, I forget how many in number there were, that he promised, Jesus promises overcomers. One of them is we will not experience the second death. Another one is we have a new name written down in glory, and it's ours, right? We all have a new name. The next point I want to make is out of Luke 23, verses 39 through 43 on this subject. It concerns the malefactors, the, the thieves on the crosses on either side of Jesus. One of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art the same condemnation? And we, indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He called him Lord. He, he expressed his faith. He confessed with his mouth the Lord Jesus. And he believed in his heart that God will raise him from the dead. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today, not after some extended period of time in purgatory or whatever, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. He didn't have time for baptism. He didn't have time to, to keep the Sabbath. He didn't have time to do anything other than trust the Lord. Believe upon the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. The calling part, I always tell people, those that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You've already believed. Who can call on him, Paul says, unless he believe first? And who can believe unless there's a preacher? And who can preach unless he be sent? So today thou shalt be with me in paradise, he answers. Point number three, Paul makes it clear that he believes this is true in the following passages. And I give two of them. There's more of them, but 2 Corinthians 5.8 says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. He also expresses the same belief in Philippians 1, 21 through 24 where he says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now how would it be gain if you if you lived in a tomb for a couple thousand years before the rapture. That's not gain to me. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet that I shall choose, I wot not. It's not up to me. It's up to God, isn't it? How long we live. For I'm a straight betwixt two, having a desire to depart. Oh man, do I desire to depart, don't you? I'd love to be in heaven right now. I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So Paul is adamant about his belief throughout the epistles 
that when we die, we go into the immediate presence of Christ. There's no questions in the New Testament. I don't know where, well, I do know where they get soul sleep from, but I don't have time to get into that. So look at this next note that's, that I put in here on, from C.I. Schofield. You know, I get a lot of uh, inspiration from, I don't know if you guys uh, read The Sword of the Lord. I love it. It's a great, great magazine. And they have a lot of uh, old-timey preachers and evangelists from times gone by, and I read their sermons, and they're just great. C.I. Schofield writes this about the two resurrections. The testimony of Scripture, then, is clear that believers' bodies are raised from among the bodies of unbelievers and caught up to meet the Lord in the air a thousand years before the resurrection of the latter. So he's saying we know the saved here and now are raptured, and a thousand years after that, actually a thousand seven years after that, the, uh, the latter. It should be firmly held that the doctrine of the resurrection concerns only the bodies of the dead. Their spirit and soul are instantly in conscious. I want to emphasize that conscious. It's not like you float around on a cloud playing a harp for 2,000 years. You're aware of what's going on on, on earth. And we're going to talk about it. And we're going to show scriptural proof. You still know your friends. You still know your loved ones. We'll show. We'll prove it. But you're in instant conscious bliss or woe. It is appointed unto men once to die and then the judgment. There's no second chance in purgatory. Please warn your Catholic friends of this. There's no second chance. What you do with Jesus in this life is the last opportunity you get. The only unforgivable sin is to keep saying, no, Holy Spirit, no, no. Quit convicting. In fact, quit convicting me of sin. I don't, I'm good. I don't need Jesus. And then you walk through life a little more. And the Holy Spirit uses a couple witnesses to bear down on you. And you go, no, 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 I'm good. I'm cool. I'm, I'm all right. I don't need Jesus. I go to church on Sunday. I keep the sacraments. <sighs> We've got to warn them, folks. I put a couple verses here for you. Philippians 1.23. Uh, oh, well, actually, Schofield writes uh, Philippians 1.23 and 2 Corinthians 5.8, which we did say. Now, the one that he references that we didn't look at yet is Luke 16. Let's go there real quick. Luke chapter 16. And verse 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Now, Abraham's bosom, that's where the Old Testament saints went, is now in heaven. We'll get into that later, too. We don't have time to develop that. But I want you to notice that they were he died and then was carried by the angels. There's no intermittent time here. And the rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lifted up his eyes. Now, they don't have their physical uh, new bodies yet. I just want you to think about that for a while. Eyes, he can see. What's going on? Being in torments. He can feel pain. Hmm. And I'm going to develop this later. My thought is this. He sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cries and he says, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus. He still remembers Lazarus. That he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I'm tormented in this flame. So the ability to feel pain, the, abil the ability to be tormented by thoughts of our past, the ability of knowing our loved ones maybe aren't saved, and then the thought that Jesus has to comfort us in the present heaven. We're going to develop all of this, and the, where I'm going with this, and it'll be in the days coming, is that perhaps, and I believe it's true, we have some form of heavenly body that we, we dwell in, until our new resurrected bodies are raptured. And I'll develop this more as we go. And uh, perhaps they're, they're like the angels that had bodies and visited, they visited Abraham, didn't they? And uh, they ate with him. So I just want you to, to and, and in the present heaven, there's a lot of scripture that talks about, even in the present heaven, the tree of light, eating from the tree of life. And like I said, we'll get into all that later. But somehow these people, their souls had gone 
Lazarus and uh, the story there of the, the poor man that was in heaven, they knew what was going on. They were aware of their surroundings. I've got a uh, visiting evangelist here with us today. His name is D.L. Moody. He's 182 years old. <laughs> Mr. Moody, why don't you come on up here and, and give us your thoughts on this subject of not being in soul sleep. Thank you. I've aged well. I heard that. I have to say, I cannot agree with some people that Paul has been sleeping in the grave and is still there after the storms of 1800 years. I cannot believe that he who loved the master, who had such a burning zeal for him, has been separated from him in an unconscious state. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. This is Christ's prayer. Amen. Now, when a man believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, he gets eternal life. A great many people make a mistake right here. Here that he that believeth on the Son hath, H A T H, hath eternal life. That's right, preacher, brother. It does not say he shall have it when he comes to die. It is in the present tense. It is mine right now, if I believe. Amen. He is the gift of God. That is enough. You can't bury the gift of God. You can't bury eternal life. All the grave diggers in the world can't dig a grave large enough and deep enough to hold eternal life. All the coffin makers of the world can't make a coffin large enough and deep enough to hold eternal life. That is mine. It is mine indeed. I believe when Paul said to be absent from the body and present with the Lord, he meant what he said, that he was not going to be separated from him for 1,800 years, that the spirit that he got when he was converted, he got from a new life and a new nature. And they could not lay that away in a sepulcher. They could not bury that that flew to meet its maker. It may be he is not satisfied and will not be until the resurrection. But Christ says he will then travail of his soul and not and, and excuse me and be satisfied. Even the body shall be raised. This body, sown in dishonor, shall be raised in glory. This body, which was put on corruption, shall put on incorruption. And this mortal shall put on immortality. It is only a question of time. The great morning of the world will, by and by, dawn upon the earth, and the dead shall come forth and shall hear the voice of him who is the resurrection and the life. Paul says, if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, and he could take down the clay temple if he wished and leave that. But he had a better house. He says in a place, I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for me. To me it is sweet thought to think that death does not separate us from the master. Amen. A great many people are living continually in bondage of death. But if I have eternal life, death cannot touch that. It may touch the house I live in. It may change my continence and send my body away to the grave, but it cannot touch this new life. To me, it is very sad to think that so many professed Christians look upon death 
as they do. Amen. Thanks, Brother Moody. You may want to help this old man back to his chair. <laughs> Brother Moody, what happened to the beard? Yeah, he's not heavy set enough either, but you get, you get the idea, the gist of it, right, everybody? I thought that was good preaching. And I want to tell you that a couple of things caught my eye in that uh, sermon, mini sermon of D.L. Moody's. And one of them is where he says that, if you go back into your outline, where Mr. Moody says, he that believeth on the Son hath, and he's very emphatic about it. It's present tense. It does not say he shall have it when he comes to die. And then we read in the beginning of our uh, uh, topic today, 1 John 5, 10 through 13. Keep that one in mind when you're witnessing to people. And then the other one, I, the other point I wanted to make about his sermon is, look where he says that Paul says, if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands. Now, you know, you might say, well, he's talking about when the church is raptured, we're going to get our new bodies and we're going to have a new tabernacle. But I still believe if we look at 2 Corinthians 12, 2 through 4, and I'll just read them to you where Paul has a vision. I want you to think about Paul's vision now, okay? As I read this to you, think about it in context of what Moody was saying. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body, I can't tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows. Such an one caught up into the third heaven. Now, as we all know, the first heaven is the earth's atmosphere, the second heaven is the stars and planets, and the third heaven is the present heaven where God is right now. He was caught up into the third heaven. And I knew such a man, again, he says, whether in the body or out of the body, I can't tell. From his vision, he couldn't tell. Only God knows how that he was caught up into, he calls it paradise this time. So, and that's going to be something else we talk about, the idea of paradise being in heaven. So anyway, he says he heard unspeakable words which is not lawful for man to utter. So we don't know everything. But we do know certain things from Scripture. We know we enjoy a physical, absolute physical place in the present heaven. And that there are physical things there that we're going to talk about later. And that we have the ability to enjoy that, that atmosphere. And we'll talk about some of that. So anyway, I thought that was a really good uh, sermon. Thank you, Mr. Moody. And uh, we'll move on. There are more scriptural proofs that the believer's soul and spirit are in heaven before their resurrected bodies. And this is found in, uh, or at least one example is found in Revelation chapter 6. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Revelation chapter 6. I want to set this up for you, too. We're going to be reading, uh, studying verses 9 through 11 in chapter 6. Now, keep your thumb there and just kind of turn the page back one page to chapter 4. And I want to set this up. First off, uh, John has been given an open door into heaven to look to peer into heaven. In verse 1 it says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So this is a future event in heaven. That's the setting. And he sees God on the throne. He explains what he saw on the throne. And then in verse 4 he says, Round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twelve, uh, twenty elders, twenty-four elders, sitting clothed in white raiment. That signifies the saints were pure in the blood of Christ. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now, we don't receive our crowns or our rewards until after the judgment seat of Christ. And the judgment seat of Christ doesn't occur until we're raptured. So I believe these are representative, these 24 elders are representative elders of the church, the raptured church. So the, the church is in heaven already. Another thing, and we don't have time to develop it, when they get into chapter 
6 and beyond, you will never see the church mentioned again in the book of Revelation. Now, over to chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, the point I'm trying to make here. By the time you get to chapter 9, the first four horses, the four horses, the first four seals have already been opened. We're already well into the tribulation period. So keep that in mind. The church has been raptured. We're well into the tribulation period, the judgment of God upon an unbelieving earth. And in verse 9, it says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, Jesus opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. Now under the altar is significant because in the Old Testament, the blood of the sacrifice and was under the altar. So the blood of Christ is on these souls. It's very significant. And they were slain. So this is, this is after the beginning of the tribulation. These are tribulation saints in heaven, slain for the word of God and for their testimony which they held. And look what these individuals do. They cry out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? To me, this shows that they're aware, even though they don't have their new bodies, their soul and spirits are under the altar of God. They are there in heaven. They are aware that their brothers and sisters on the earth are being tortured like they were and persecuted like they were. And they are aware of that going on. And they're petitioning the Lord to take vengeance on them. So the point I'm trying to make is I truly believe that when we die and go to the present heaven, we are aware of those we loved and we see in heaven and those we still love and care for on the earth. And I believe at that point in time, we're still petitioning the Lord. I can picture myself, if I were in heaven right now, I'd be saying, Lord, please send somebody to Eric. Please send somebody to save him. Just like these people are crying out for vengeance. And then look what he does. God says, and, and white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest for a while, a little season, until the fellow servants also and their brethren, that they should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. So he comforts them. And he says that we have a little bit of time yet. And he's, he's speaking of the, the wrath of God, that next five or so years that still has to be poured out on the earth. And uh, there's a lot that has to happen. The Jewish people come to know Christ. And... Uh, so I, the point I'm trying to make here is that I believe that we know some of what's going on on the earth and heaven. So let's close this up. Let's conclude with an overview of heaven because I want you to get the gist of what we've covered so far last week and this week to kind of set up what we're going to talk about next week. I'm going to try to tie them together because we've got two more parts to go of just the present heaven. So we're not done yet. Conclusions and overview of the present heaven. So what is the present heaven? One, we go there upon physical death. I think we've established that. And remain until the close of this age and the tribulation period. We are with Jesus waiting for the resurrection of our earthly resurrected bodies. We are aware of at least some. Give me that much, will you? From Revelation 6.11. I have troubles convincing people of this. But, and I'm not dogmatic about it. If you don't want to believe it, you don't have to. But I believe the word of God makes it plain. We're aware of some of what's going on on the earth. In the lives of people on this earth. And we know each other. I'll just throw that in. Four. We will be aware and active in prayer and praise in the present heaven. And there are many verses in the book of Revelation that support that. Where the saints are praising God. And they're praising him for the fact that we will be kings and priests upon the earth. And that we have overcome. And that we've inherited all things. There's a lot of proof in that. Five, we will return with Jesus when he snatches up his church at the end of this age to meet our new bodies in the air with him and return to the present heaven with him. You can see that in 1 Thessalonians 4.14. I don't have time to go there, but I hope you look it up. Because you'll see that he actually, God, the Bible says, comes down with us. We don't touch the earth. Our souls are with him. 
and the dead in Christ rise first, and then we which are alive and remain join them in the air. So they get their new bodies, but if you look at that verse, you'll see, well, where did they come from if they came with God? They came from heaven. That means we're in heaven. There's no soul sleep. So there's another. I just threw that in there. There's another proof. Number six, we stand at the judgment seat of Christ and attend the marriage supper of the Lamb during the tribulation. Now, the thing I want to point out, and when we looked at chapter four in the book of Revelation, the seals hadn't been opened yet. So I believe, and I'm, I'm not dogmatic about this, I kind of side with the commentaries that say the church is raptured and it takes a while for the earth to digest what just happened. Millions of people have disappeared. They're in panic and shock. They have not revealed, the Antichrist has not been revealed yet. So maybe there's a period of time, and I, I won't say how long, but a period of time after the rapture, before Jesus opens that first seal and begins the seven-year period, before the uh, 70th week of Daniel starts, where the treaty between Israel and Palestine is, is signed, before that. And the reason I say that is they already had their crowns. They've already received their rewards, so we've already been at the judgment seat of Christ. I think the judgment seat of Christ is immediately after the rapture of the church and just before the opening of the seals. But I, I don't get uh, crazy about it. That's just something I want you to think about. So in the present heaven, point seven, we don't live there for eternity. We talked about that. We wait for the resurrection of our new bodies. Uh, the support verses are all here. You can look these up later. We attend the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb. You can look at that in Revelation 19, 1 through 9. We return with Jesus to rule and reign with him for a thousand years on the present earth, never to return to the present heaven. Uh, Revelation 19, 11 through uh, 20, verse 6. After the thousand year reign, we have a stopover with him to judge the lost at the great white throne judgment. You can read that in uh, Revelation 20, 11 through 5. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3 says, Do you not know that all the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know you not that we shall judge the angels? How much more the things that pertain to this life? Point E, from there we go to the new heaven and new earth, praise God, the new city Jerusalem for eternity. So that's our eternal future, our eternal destiny. And that sums up the four phases I talked about last week that we're going to try and draw together as we go through the next weeks. Now I'm just going to read what, uh, how Andy Ralcorn, Alcorn, it's a good book by the way, if you want to get Randy's book, he states this about heaven. When we die as believers in Christ, we will not go to the heaven where, where we'll live forever. Instead, we go to an intermediate heaven where those who died covered by Christ's blood are now. We'll await the time of Christ's return to the earth and bodily resurrection, the final judgment and the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. If we fail to grasp this truth, we will fail to understand the biblical doctrine of heaven. And... Uh, I just, you know, I get excited about the fact that when we die, we're going to see Jesus. We're going to get to see all the Old Testament saints. I got so many. Uh, I just, I, I just can't wait to meet them and ask a few questions. And uh, of course, we get to see our loved ones again. We give Lori a big hug and, and be forever reunited with with my wife again. I just, I can't wait to be with my loved ones. I have many friends. You know, they say that you can tell you're getting old when you seem to have more friends in the next life than you still have on this earth. And I'm starting to accumulate a lot of friends. Yes, Horst. Uh, you raised an interesting point. Under the conclusion, Roman numeral 2, number 4, you said we will be aware and active in prayer and praying. And you used Revelation chapter 6 martyred saints because they cry out to God how long yes. and I, I understand that I, I agree 100% I wonder if this prayer I'm, I'm wondering about this prayer part is this prayer part that you pull out of this normative for heaven because prayer seems to indicate that there's a burden in our heart that we want God to change or correct and so forth and yes. my thoughts about heaven would be that we wouldn't have burdens we wouldn't need 
Well, I'm, I'm actually I'm glad you brought that up, Brother Horse, because here's why. Next week we're going to talk about this. The reason the Bible talks about how we'll be comforted in heaven and how that the tears will be wiped from our eyes when we, right before we go into the new heaven and new earth, is because we will, at, I believe, at the great white throne judgment and even before that, we will know of people that we love that died and went to an eternity without Christ. And we will be grieved by that, and we will require comfort. Now, I'm going to have to ask you to just kind of push the believe button for now, but we will go into that next week. We will give it supporting scripture. And my thought is this. Those tribulation saints did not have their resurrected bodies. Their souls were in heaven. That's where we're going to be when we die, in that position. So I believe what was true for them is going to be true for us. Anyway, let's pray and close. Dear God, I thank you for the promise of going to heaven when we die, of going into your immediate presence where you will comfort us. And Lord, I pray that those we love that are still here on the earth that are around us in our circle of influence, that every one of us in here will use what we know about heaven and what we learn about heaven over the next few weeks and our future to confidently tell those we love of the hope that's in us and what they will miss out on if they don't come to Christ. Lord, help us to open our mouths and be a witness to those around us with confidence. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.